Good morning, Encounter at Home. Good morning, Encounter. I'm Emily. I'm Rudy. Thank you so much for joining us from home this morning. If it is your first time watching with us, text the word CONNECT to 501-510-6020, and we will reach out to you, send you a gift. We want you to feel like you are part of the Encounter family. Absolutely. So we are one week down, seven days down of our 21 days of prayer and fasting. (laughs) One week down, two to go. So, Rudy, tell me a little bit about why prayer and fasting is so important. Well, prayer and fasting is so important because it allows you to get that more intimate, deeper connection with God. When you want to get to those certain places spiritually, I mean, it's nothing better than prayer and fasting. Of course, it gets a little tough because, yes, you want to grab that piece of candy or, yes, you want to drink that coffee. But that's that's when you go to prayer and you go to go ahead and get the Lord's help and let him get you through some things spiritually. Yep, yep, that's so correct and so good. We also have our prayer nights during the prayer, whatever, 21 days of prayer and fasting this Saturday. And then we have mega prayer night on the 28th, both at 6 p.m. So that'll be really, really good. And then we also have Baptism Sunday on the 29th. One of my faves. Love Baptism Sunday. Yes, it's so good. If you want to sign up for to be water baptized, text the word water to 501-510-6020 and um, come be here with us. Come cheer on the people that are getting baptized. I know some youth students already told me that they're getting baptized this time, which is super exciting. So yeah, it's going to be an awesome Sunday. And we have a guest speaker today. We do. It's actually a little treat. Yeah, so good. Last service was so good. This is, um, he flew all the way from Virginia. Virginia. Yes, and he is, um, he is Pastor James' roommate from college. This should be interesting. Yes. (laughs) So, definitely um, pretty cool. He's an overseer at the church. Rodney Pavey, he is awesome. So, yeah, it's going to be a great Sunday. It will be. Well, we're about to go into worship, so get ready, get your notebooks out, have an awesome morning. Bye, guys. Good morning, guys. Bye. Good morning, Encounter Church. Thank you all so much for coming out today. Would you please stand and worship with us? There is no shadow that could ever overcome your life. Come on. There is no rival that could ever stand against your might. You've always been with us. Every battle you've already won, no, we've already won, yeah! There is no weapon that has ever left a mark on you, and there is no army with the power to conquer truth. You've always been with us. 
every battle you've already won, we've already won. Show me one thing he can't do. Show me a mountain he can't move. He's the God of the breakthrough and anything is possible. Whoa! Show me one thing that's too hard. Show me what else he can't part. He's the God of the breakthrough and anything is possible. It's possible. And there is a kingdom that's advancing at the speed of a light. And in his kingdom, every dead thing is bound to rise. And God, our Redeemer, he is faithful to revive. Oh, he will revive. Show me one thing he can't do. Show me a mountain he can't move. He's the God of the breakthrough and anything is possible. Do you believe it? Show me one thing that's too hard. Show me what else he can't part. He's the God of the breakthrough and anything is possible. It's possible. turn into praise shake off despair as i sing out your name a victory dance i will dance out in faith i will crush disappointment and break every chain well all of my fear i will turn into praise shake off despair as i sing out your name a victory dance i will dance out in faith i will crush disappointment
for a Lord and a Savior that never fails us. Can we just lift up his name this morning? Can we give him praise? Amen. We have a God that does not fail. Amen. Amen. Welcome to Encounter Church. We are so glad that you are here with us this morning in person and online. And we are thankful that you chose Encounter Church to worship with. If this is your first time here, we want to say welcome and thank you for choosing Encounter Church. And so if this is your first time, we want to connect with you. And my lovely assistant, Maya, has got a card here she wants to show you. This is in the seat back in front of you. And if you would fill that card out and if you would take it to the guest services desk, they have a gift for you today. And if you are watching online, we would love to connect with you as well. And we want you to text the word CONNECT, C-O-N-N-E-C-T, and text that word to 501-510-6020, and we have a gift for you as well. We promise not to hound you. We just want to learn more about you and how we can help you along the way and along your walk with Jesus. And also on that card at the bottom is a place where you can fill out prayer requests. And we as a church believe that Jesus is still answering prayer, right? And so we want to pray with you and for you. And so if you want to fill that out, you can drop that part in the offering bucket with, uh, as the offering comes around today. Or you can text the word PRAY to 501-510-6020. And we will contact you and someone will be in prayer with you. And I just want to remind you that 714 prayer is happening during the weekdays. We prayed all this week. How many of you enjoyed that? All right. Guess what? It's still going to happen this week, 714 a.m., you are seven days into prayer and fasting. How about that? So you made it, all right? So 14 more days left. And last night from 6 to 7, there were 35 of us here praying together. And so when you walked in, if you felt the Spirit still lingering here, that's because you can just say thank you because we left him here to, to linger for you. We brought him back this morning. And so we are going to meet this Saturday as well from 6 to 7 and pray together. We'd love to see 40 of us here. 
praying together and just praying for our community, praying for things that are going on within our own lives. And I just want to say thank you for praying. And even if you couldn't make it here, you were praying at your places of work and praying at home. Thank you so much for showing up on 714 and praying together. It has been amazing. And so thank you for that. And you can also send an email to pray at encounterchurch.tv and a pastor will get that and we'll get back in contact with you as well. And so um, there's also, Maya is holding this beautiful orange Pray First book and you can get that out at the guest services center or ask somebody that has a, a lanyard on. They will get you one of those books. This is very helpful for praying scripture and praying through the Bible. And so that has been great this week as I've been... Um, fasting and praying and finding out what God wants me to do. And sometimes he says things I don't like to hear. And so, so it's been very useful for that. So thank you, Maya. Let's give her a hand for helping me this morning. So it is also my privilege to take up the offering this morning. And God evaluates our actions based on our attitudes. And some of us have had to fast our attitudes too. Um, but John 3.16 reveals God's attitude towards giving. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. And it says that God loved, so he gave. Because God loved, he gave. And so because God is love, he is also a giver. And so he set the example of generosity motivated by love. And so an attitude of love in giving is crucial. 1 Corinthians 13, 3 tells us that I, if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, but I have not love, I have nothing. I have nothing. So when you're motivated by the love of Jesus and you give, then you are empowering Encounter Church to reach the community for Jesus' sake. Did you know that? And so I'm going to tell you some of the ways that we've reached the community, okay? Okay. So you empower Encounter Church, E-Kids, to reach up to 30 children every week for Jesus. 30 kids are back there learning about Jesus and how much he loves them and how much he loves them individually. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. That's the theology that they're learning. Carl Barth said, that's all the theology I need. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And that's what they're learning back there. You empower Encounter Church to feed the homeless and those who need just a little bit of help every other Saturday down at the transportation center. Yesterday they went down there and they fed 75 meals to people. So that's fantastic. Thank you, Encounter Church, because you enabled us to do that. You empower E-teens to feed and reach 35 teens each week. That's amazing, thank you. And that you have adults who are reaching those kids as well and that they are giving the life-giving message of Jesus to each one of them. And did you know that they have an affirmation that they do every single week? That they have somebody stand up here. One of those kids are standing up here, and they're leading them in an affirmation. And I have to look at it because I don't know it by heart like they do. And they say, I am called. I am a servant. Oops, sorry, I did it wrong. I am chosen. I am called. I am a servant, and Jesus loves me. And they believe that with all their heart. And so I am so thankful for E-teens and for what you give so that they can do that. And if you've noticed today, E-teens are serving down here, making sure that the broadcast gets out to all over the world. We have somebody from the Philippines watching this morning, just so that you know. It's going out all over the world because these kids are serving this morning. So thank you for your giving. So as you stand this morning, as our ushers come, I want to pray with us this morning. And see, the reason I say that it's my honor to serve and my honor to take up the offering is because our giving is a part of worship as much as our singing, as much as listening to the service, as much as listening to the sermon, because our giving is acting like God. So Lord, this morning as we give, I would just want to thank you for giving first, for showing us what it means to give out of love. And so, Lord, as each one here, as they take their offering out, as they give themselves to you first, Lord, we just want to give to you. And, Lord, we ask that this offering today would be used to show the community what it means to be like Jesus. Lord, as we continue in worship, may we give our whole selves to you today. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Would you stand and continue to worship?
tried so hard to see it It took me so long to believe it You choose someone like me To carry your victory Perfection could never hurt me You give what we don't deserve And you take the broken things You raise them to glory You are my champion Giants fall when you stand undefeated
watch the spirit just begin to lift up something to it. Your own hallelujah. Whatever that looks like for you. If you've got a prayer request, you've got something going on. It's so important to speak that out. When Jesus was creating us, he spoke it all into life. He created light, he spoke it, it existed. When we lift our voice and shout, it's so important. It's so important. Give whatever you have to God this morning. Lift it with your voice. Let the devil know that you're going to God with what you've got going on. Come on, let's lift it up just one more time. When we lift our voice. Let's give him praise. Come on, let's lift him up. Come on, come on. He deserves it. He's worthy. We thank you so much for choosing to worship with us this morning. Please be seated. Relax. Pay attention to this video, and then we'll be right back with the message. Happy Sunday. Welcome home. If today is your first Sunday with us, we have a free gift for you. There is a card in the seat back in front of you. Fill it out and take it to the Welcome Center in the lobby. We just wanna say hello. Growth Track is where you learn more about Encounter, find out your specific gift mix, and so much more. Our next cycle starts tonight at 6 p.m. To register, text WELCOME to 501-510-6020. 21 Days of Prayer and Fasting. We have the Pray First books available. You can pick it up in the lobby at either of our campus locations, or you can text FIRST to 501-510-6020 or have one sent to you. We will be going live on Facebook at 7.14 a.m. every morning to pray first together as a church body. Join us the next two Saturdays at 6 p.m. for a time of prayer. And then next Saturday of January 28th for Mega Prayer Night at 6 p.m. It's not too late to join us as we go through the One Year Bible as a church. Make sure you purchase one from our Welcome Center, or if you are watching from home, you can text BIBLE to 501-510-6020 to have a purchased one sent to you. Water baptism is coming up. We will be doing a water baptism to wrap up our 21 days of prayer and fasting. If you would like to be baptized, text WATER to 501-510-6020. Thank you everyone so much for watching and everybody take notes and just really lean into the message. Bye. And welcome Encounter Church. Well, my name is Rodney Pavey and for those of you that don't know me, um, I am the executive pastor at Life Church in Mechanicsville, Virginia, uh, just outside of Richmond. And it's, I've also been honored and blessed to be an overseer here at Encounter uh, since the church's inception. And uh, 
I just want to brag on this worship team. They did such an amazing job leading us into the presence of the Lord this morning. Uh, done a great, great job. Brag on Sister Tina. She's done a great job. Pastor Tina's done an amazing job uh, leading this church and leading you all. And uh, so thank her for all that she does to serve around here. Well, as an overseer, I've had the privilege of really being a fan of Encounter. Um, but more than that, I've been invested in this church for a long time uh, since it was in a garage. Uh, so <laughs> as an overseer, uh, I'm the guy that Pastor James calls when he needs to talk through stuff. Sometimes when he needs to complain about you. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I, also get to <laughs> I also get to celebrate with him through victories, and I take seriously my responsibility to hold you up in prayer. And uh, when Pastor James and Deidre go through tough times, I'm thankful to be able to walk through those tough times with them Amen. because they've walked through tough times with me. And uh, you may not know this, but Pastor and I have been connected for all of our adult life. Uh, we were roommates in Bible college, and we've walked through life together through great times and through difficult times. And uh, we've watched our children grow up together. We've uh, suffered through ministry hurt together and family hurts together. And we've also celebrated and rejoiced together and uh, dream together, believe together, look forward to great things together. And Amen. eventually, we'll probably brag about our future grandkids together, right? Um, not yet. We don't have, neither one of us have any of those yet, but we'll have them eventually, I'm sure. Uh, some people, God brings into your life for a season. But then there are other people that God brings into your life, and they're meant to last for life. And uh, my relationship with Pastor James, I believe, is one of the latter. And I believe my connection to Encounter Church is meant to be that way as well. So when your pastor called me a little over a month ago and said, uh, shared some things that he was going through and asked if I would be willing to come, uh, that he just needed a little bit of time to refresh and recharge his batteries and kind of uh, have a fresh vision for the upcoming year, I was thankful to get the call. Um, I, if I lived in Hot Springs, I would be coming to Encounter Church. And so uh, you, you made a great choice today in coming here. And so I'm thankful to be here as well. I say all that to tell you today that I'm really, really thankful that you chose to come to church this morning because I truly believe God has something special for you or you wouldn't be here. I believe every time we uh, submit ourselves to God, God opens doors for us to be able to truly connect to him in great and amazing ways. And so today I want to share with you a message. Uh, we're going to begin today for the story from the Old Testament, one of my favorite uh, characters in the Bible. We're going to use his story to kind of look at some things that the Apostle Paul says in the New Testament. Uh, so let's start today by turning to Genesis chapter 37. If you don't have your Bible, they can, you can follow along on the screen, of course. Uh, this is the beginning portions of the story of the life of Joseph. Uh, many of you may have heard of him. You may have watched his, uh, his animated movie, uh, or you may have even gone to Broadway and seen the, the show, the uh, Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat, and I guess they kind of use that story from Genesis to make that, but... Uh, Joseph is the 11th son of 12, and uh, he was Jacob's favorite, and he was a bit of a rat, if I'm being honest. Whenever his brothers would do anything wrong, Joseph was running to dad to rat him out, right? He was going to let him know. And uh, as the favorite son, Jacob had this amazing coat made for Joseph. Uh, we know it as the coat of many colors. And at the age of 17, it was so apparent that he was the favorite son that his brothers really had kind of begun to hate him. Uh, you know that kind of kid that, you know, you just like, ah, oh, he gets on your nerves so bad? That was Joseph. Maybe you have a sibling like that. I don't know. I have two brothers, and I don't know that I ever would say I hate them, but every now and then, you know, it can feel that way. Um, but I hope they don't watch this. Uh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> now, uh, we're going to pick up the story in verse, in, chapter, in verse 5 of Genesis chapter 37, and you can follow along on the screen. One night, Joseph had a dream. And when he told his brothers about it, they hated him more than ever. Listen to this dream, he said. We were out in the field tying up bundles of grain, and suddenly my bundle stood up, and your bundles all gathered round and bowed low before mine. His brothers responded, so you think you're going to be our king? Do you? Do you actually think you will reign over us? And they hated him all the more because of his dreams and the way he talked about them. Soon, Joseph had another dream, and again, he told his brothers about it. Listen, I have had another dream, he said. The sun, the moon, the 11 stars all bowed low before me. This time, he told the dream to his father as well to his brothers, but his father scolded him. He said, what kind of dream is that? 
Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow to the ground before you? But while his brothers were jealous of Joseph, his father wondered what the dreams meant. So Joseph has these amazing dreams. And truthfully, if he's like any of us, he had played out exactly how those dreams were going to come to pass. His 17-year-old brain thought he knew exactly what was going to happen. And in his mind, he probably thought, I'm going to tell my brothers. And when I tell them, they are going to just buy into my dream. They're going to bow down. They're going to do exactly what I saw in my dream. It's going to happen. And so with that thought in mind, I want to just share with you a thought today. And the title of my message is, When the Show Doesn't Match the Script. When the show doesn't match the script. So I love to read. I love all kinds of material. I do enjoy certain types of fiction. I enjoy comic books. For all of you comic book fans, I enjoy spy novels. I enjoy legal fiction. I enjoy even some allegorical fantasy. Um, if you're a reader of anything that's popular in culture, you'll know what I mean when I say that you've experienced this probably when they take a book that you have really enjoyed and then they make it into a movie. Thank you. <laughs> so for most readers, particularly if you read fiction at all, you create characters in your mind. You know what that guy looks like. You know what she's supposed to look like. You know what the town looks like. You've got it all played out in your mind. A good writer gives you lots of context clues as to what things are supposed to look like, how they look, how they dress. And from those clo clues, we draw conclusions in our mind of how things are supposed to go in the story. And so we see the movie that's based on our favorite book, and rarely do they get it right. I mean, the characters that they cast are not who you imagined. And the town, it just doesn't look the same. And come to think of it, the story's even different. And that really good character that you really liked, that was your favorite one, he doesn't even show up at all. And you finish watching and you're frustrated. Why? Because the show doesn't match the script. We had a script. It was a good script. But what they made was apparently someone else's interpretation of the script, and it just doesn't match. And you know, the truth is, sometimes our walk with God is exactly the same way. Whether it's a church or an individual, God gives us a dream. He, he, he gives us things in our mind, places, callings in our mind, or his will for our lives, and we play it out in our mind exactly how we think it's going to be. How many of you ever struggled with the will of God for your life? Am I the only one? We have in our minds how it's supposed to play out, right? We may even give God some nudges along the way, help him to see it our way. You know what, God? We think this is God's will for me. He gave me this dream, and I've seen it in my mind. I know how it's going to happen. And we began to play out the scenarios and help him to see it our way. And we think this is God's will for me. He gave me this dream, and I've seen it. How it's going to happen, and we write the script for our life. We play it out. We know how it's going to come to pass. We have the path. We, we set it out. We know exactly what's going to happen, and we chart our course. I'm going to go to school for this, and I'm going to marry this person, and we're going to have this many children, and we're going to buy this house, and we're going to live in this neighborhood by the time we're this age, and we're going to serve in the kingdom of God in this capacity, and we're going to accomplish these things, and people are going to notice us, and they're going to recognize us as being great, and we have our script. But then we see the show. Actually, we start to live the show. And it doesn't match our script. And it's not the shiny dream that you saw. It's, it's what's different. The show doesn't match the script. What we're really saying is it doesn't match my version of the script. It doesn't match my perspective, how I see this playing out, how I thought this would come to pass. God, am I a disappointment somehow? Because what I'm seeing in my life is not what I saw. Did I mess up? Did I fail? Did I do something wrong? Did I make a mistake? Because what I got is not matching what you showed me. And I imagine Joseph felt that way. I read to you his dreams. I would imagine that his interpretation was extremely elaborate, right? I mean, he's 17. I'm sure he thought he's going to be king of the world by the time he was 17 and a half. 
But a short time later, he comes to check on his brothers, and they are fed up with his dreaming and his scheming, and they steal his coat, and they're going to kill him. And one brother, Reuben, has compassion, I suppose, and he convinces the brothers not to kill him, but to toss him in a pit and just leave him there. Hopefully, he'll just die on his own, but intending later to bring, come back and kind of let him out. But then Judah, his other brother, gets a bit greedy, and he says, hey, those some guys over there. Let's just sell him to them. They'll take him to Egypt, and we will be done with him. And that's what they do. And in Egypt, Joseph works for a high-ranking official named Potiphar until Mrs. Potiphar makes a move on him, and he didn't want to respond. And so he reject, he, she, feeling rejected, accuses him of rape, and he gets sent to jail. And while he's in prison, he sits, and he's forgotten about. It's a far cry from the script that Joseph had received. And this morning, <clears throat> I would venture to guess that some of us are sitting here and we're frustrated and we're irritated, maybe even a little disappointed in God or ourselves because we're viewing our life, even the plans for the ministry, maybe even of this church, we're viewing them through a lens or a script where we decided what we thought was God's will for us. We came up with a plan. We decided that if we could have this job or perform this ministry or marry this guy or this girl or arrive at this destination, then we'd fulfill the will of God for us. And part of our problem is really understanding God's calling or God's will for our lives. We live in a society that is motivated by achievement, right? We are consistently being taught to strive for a destination. When you arrive at this point in your life, then you're successful. When you accomplish this task, you're going to feel good about yourself. If you want to be involved in ministry, you have to aspire to reach this level, or until you do this, you haven't fulfilled the will of God. And so if we truly want to please God, we many times operate with a faulty mental construct that says, there's only one person that I can marry, only one ministry that I can have. There's only one path I can travel. There's only one career for me because God's will says, this is the script. And it's supposed to be lived out in my life. So I'm just curious, how many of you have lived at least part of your Christian life trying to figure out the will of God, right? We sometimes operate from a position of fear because while we're trying to figure it out, we're afraid that if we don't do it just right, if we're going to make God angry. He will withhold his blessings. Why? Because we missed his will for our life. And if that's you, I'm not minimizing your feelings today. Please don't take it that way. Because I've lived a large part of my adult life struggling with the exact same concept. God, you called me to this, and I don't see a path to get there. How can I fulfill your will if I'm stuck in a pit and I'm falsely accused and I'm stuck in prison? None of that lines up with the script where people are supposed to be bowing down to me. You called me to this ministry or this plan or this job and I'm not there. So God, you must be upset with me because it's not working out the way you told me it would. So what happens when the guy you thought was this Mr. Wonderful turns out to be a jerk? Or what happens when the job you thought was God's plan turns out to be a dead end? Or what happens when your spouse, the one you thought was the only one possible for you, walks out and leaves you all alone? What happens when the ministry that you thought you'd have, the one you believed God called you to, blows up in your face and you see no path forward? Did you fail? Did you mess up somehow? Are you being punished because you fell short somewhere along the way? Do we honestly think that God's will is so small that he would trust it to us who he already declared in his word would surely fall short? He said, he literally, he says, every one of us will sin and fall short of the glory of God. Is his will so small that he would trust it to us to make sure we do everything perfect to get it right? So understand, I'm not suggesting God didn't give you a dream. I'm not suggesting that God's call is not on your life. I'm not suggesting that we should endeavor to do anything other than fulfill God's will. But what I am suggesting is it's not nearly as complicated as we've made it. We're carrying around a ton of pressure 
and some of us a lot of baggage, trying to fulfill this exact will of God. And I think many times it's because we have a faulty understanding of what it means to fulfill the will of God. We have this idea of being called, kind of like the NFL draft. Any of you ever watch the NFL draft at all, watch football? Okay. So this past year, Malik Willis, who was the quarterback of my alma mater, Liberty University, was drafted by the Tennessee Titans at pick number 86 in the third round of the 2022 National Football League draft. He had been projected to be an early pick by some to be maybe even the first quarterback taken in the draft, expected to be somewhere in the early first round. But for some reason, his stock began to slide, and they had this whole family of Malik Willis sitting in this booth off the stage area at the draft, and every time they'd make a call for the next person to be drafted, some guy with a camera would run into that room and show his family sitting there, dejected and wondering why their son wasn't the one being called. He sat, and he sat, and he sat. Whole first day, he sat. Most of the second day, he sits, and the call never comes. Then finally, late on the second day at pick number 86, his phone rings, and he gets the call, and we've selected you to be the quarterback of our team, and we've called you. Of all the calls we could have made, we called you. And that's many times how we see God's calling on our life, right? Out of the six plus billion people in the world that I could have called, I dialed your number. I've got you on my team. You are my quarterback. I want you to fulfill my destiny to accomplish a task. I got the call. I answered the phone. Put me in, coach. And maybe you were called to a position. I'm not belittling that if that's how you feel. But more likely, the position is not your calling, but rather a gifting that you have and that you're trying to walk in. More likely, God's call on your life is that you were called to him. Let me, let, let me explain it a little better for you. So Blake, amazing keyboard player, leading great worship. Is worship leader his call or is worship leader his gifting? Because our call is to God. Our call is to serve in the kingdom. Our call is to do the best we can, to be the best we can possibly be, to live out the will of God for our life, which is that we would fulfill his commands in our life. That's who we're supposed to be, right? We're supposed to be Christ-like. But his gifting is to blow up that keyboard and make us all feel the presence of God through it, right? But if tomorrow Blake lost his fingers and couldn't play, and I'm not wishing that on him, you know, if that happened, is he no longer fulfilling the will of God? No. No. Because the call is not the position. The call is to God, and then God can use him to do other things in the kingdom of God. Does that make sense? You with me? So there may be a myriad of ways that you can bring glory to his name using the gifts and talents that you have. But many times we miss out on the ways God could be using us because we're fighting to arrive at the keyboard. We're fighting to arrive at the pulpit, or we're fighting to arrive at the quarterback's job that we were called to. Many of us are imprisoned to our calling. We think that if we don't do this, whatever this is, whatever your calling is, then somehow we are disappointing God and frustrating ourselves. I want to set you free of all that today. Because the show that God has planned may be much different than the script that you wrote. Most of us want God to give us a step-by-step plan, right? We want to know exactly how it's going to happen, and we want to see it. We want point A to point B. We want to see it and plan it out, and it's done. And then we don't, when it doesn't work out that way, we get really angry or frustrated. And here's why. We've been convinced that somehow we are responsible to fulfill the will of God for our lives. But we've never truly understood what God's will is for our life. People run from preacher to preacher, church, at least in Virginia, Maybe in Arkansas, they don't do this. But in Virginia, people run from preacher to preacher, church to church, ministry to ministry, all wanting to ask the same question. How do I fulfill the will of God for my life? There are over 4.45 billion possible results on the internet dealing with the answer of finding God's will. Go to YouTube right now and you can find over 628 million videos 
of people talking about the will of God? Is it possible that there are a lot of people searching for God's will for them? I think so. Is it possible that we are struggling to find God's will because we've made it so complicated that we're left to search for it rather than walk in it? So with the time I have left today, I want to share with you from the words of the Apostle Paul in regards to the will of God for your life. We all, I believe, want to fulfill God's will. If you, weren't, if, if you didn't want to please God, you wouldn't be here today, right? You got up this morning, you got dressed, you came to church, and you must have something in your heart, some little, even if it's just small, a desire to please God, or your mom and dad made you come. Either way, but we're going to assume it's the first. So we all, I believe, want that, but I want to free you today from the searching for God's will as a destination that you arrive at, as if it's like a vacation home, but rather a thinking, something that you will follow in and, and begin to walk in and begin to fulfill as you live your life out for Jesus Christ. Yes. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, so dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he finds acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So my mom and dad started dragging me to church when I was six years old. And all my life, whenever I would hear someone discuss the will of God, Romans 12, 1 and 2, that verse would come up. And so many times I would leave confused because they focused on the fact that we could know God's will for us, the good and the pleasing and the perfect will of God. And I had this concept in my mind like it was Monty Hall on, a, on Let's Make a Deal, right? And there were three doors on the screen, up on the stage, and they had the good will of God, the pleasing will of God, and the perfect will of God. And you had to figure out which one you wanted to walk in. Now, I'm not stupid. I could choose good, but perfect sounds better, right? So there must be this perfect will of God that I could be in, and so I'm trying to find it, and I spend my whole life frustrated because it doesn't seem perfect to me. It's just creating frustration because I'm trying to accomplish this thing behind the door, whatever it is. And when I don't get there, God must be mad at me because he's not letting it come to pass. And I was left with this concept that there was this good will of God, this pleasing will of God, and the perfect. The object or the point of this verse is not good, pleasing, and perfect. The object of the point of this verse is to know the will of God. And it says, in essence, if you do these things, you will learn to know God's will for you. So how do we learn to know? First, we give our bodies to God as a living and holy sacrifice to him. In light of him dying for us, let's give ourselves in relationship to him. We give our bodies, putting our flesh under subjection. We submit ourselves completely to God. And how do we do that? Well, we don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. What are the behaviors and customs of this world? Well, it's certainly not to submit myself to anybody because the world teaches us to be selfish, to protect our sense of autonomy, to, to don't, you don't belong to anyone except yourself. So don't copy those selfish and humanistic behaviors and attitudes and mindsets. Instead, let God transform you. So what does that mean? Let God make me fresh and new by changing my outward appearance, my job, my station in life, my position at the church, my title on the job, my ministry focus, my spouse, my family, my home. No. That's not what that means at all. Let God make me fresh and new by changing what? The way that I think. You see, God transforms my thinking and now I'm willing to offer myself to God. If I think the way I always think, I'm never going to submit myself to God. But if I change the way I think, now I'm willing to offer myself to God. A living sacrifice for God to be my source, for God to be my direction, for God to have his way, for God to dictate the script and allow it to be performed in the fashion that he chooses. Even if it's different than the way I perceived it would be. If you live a surrendered life to God, and if you allow God to transform your mind, then you will know God's will for you. And this is important because it's not three doors to choose from. 
the good, the pleasing, and the perfect. It's not three different progressions of God's will. You start off over here at good, you get a little bit better, it becomes pleasing, and then finally you reach perfection. That's not what it is either. So here's what it is. God's will for you, being submitted to him and thinking and changing your thinking so that you're not like the world, but with a transformed mind, thinking the way he thinks, then you know what God's will is, which is good. Why is God's will good? Because God is good, right? If God is good and I am submitting myself to a good God, then naturally his will for my life is good. It is, it is good. It is, it is good, right? We're always looking for this awesome, amazing, all this stuff. I would settle for the goodness of God in my life over momentary amazement, right? I want good. God's will is also pleasing. To whom? Pleasing to you. God's will was never meant to be a drudgery or something you dreaded, but you had to do it because it was God's will. No, God wants you to be pleased with the direction of your life. He wants you to serve him with love and joy and not out of duty. You ever met somebody that they were doing it only because they had to? Looks like they've been sucking lemons half their life, right? Can't find happiness no matter where they look but they're going to show up at church on Sunday and they're going to serve. They're going to be mad while they're doing it, but they're going to serve. Oh, Pastor Tina's dragging me to another meeting. Ten minutes before church, I got to stand out here and pray with these people. Oh, I just want to do my job and go home. No, no, no. God's will was meant to be pleasing. It was meant to be something you look forward to, something you enjoy. And God's will is perfect. When we see the word perfect in Scripture... Many times we think of God's perfection, like his sinlessness, his holiness. But actually, many times in Scripture, the word perfect is referring to completion or maturity. So what Paul is actually saying is this. Let me read it to you from the Message Bible. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You will be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to a level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you develops well-formed maturity in you. See, God's will is for you to live for him, to go on a journey with him, to allow him to transform your thinking so that he can reveal his goodness in your life, so that you can live a mature Christian life that will not only please God, but will please you as well. And in the process of that, you mature in Christ, and it becomes evident that you have lived your life for Jesus Christ. That is the will of God for your life. So, that's Romans 12, one of those trouble passages I had for all my life because I'm still waiting on the three doors to show up on stage. But uh, <laughs> let me offer you another passage that I think reveals so much about your daily living your life in the will of God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 through 18, it says, Always be joyful, never stop praying, be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you. Why we make it so hard? Literally, Paul says, hey, this is God's will for you. Paul is kind of listing off this group of instructions at the end of his first letter to the church at Thessalonica, and he just rapid fires one thing after another. So he says this, God's will for you who belong to Christ. What is it? What's God's will? Always be joyful. Is it possible? Notice he didn't say always be happy because happiness is tied to happenings, events, things that happen in your life. And there are moments where you will not be happy, you will be sad. But he says always be joyful. And joyful, being joyful, being full of joy is this abiding recognition that I am his and he is mine, that I have this connection to him that lasts even when things are not good, right? When, when I have a tough time, God does not leave me. And for that, I have joy because in the presence of God is fullness of joy. So I'm always going to be joyful. He also said, never stop praying. Is that possible? 
Notice he didn't say always be kneeling and folding your hands a certain way. Notice he didn't say you got to do it a certain way. He didn't say always be in the posture of prayer. He said always be praying. And see, prayer has less to do with how I do it and more with the attitude with which I do it. See, I don't have to be kneeling to always be praying. What I have to be is connected to God to always be praying. And so my heart being open to God always allows me to have prayer working in my life always. Guess what? I can be riding down the road in the midst of the worst of circumstances, and I've got a connection to God. And he and I can talk at any point. I don't have to wait. It's kind of like this world today with all of us in our, our phones, right? You have instant access to just about anybody you're connected to. Text message, they get it on their screen. You want to see them? Do a FaceTime. Boyfriends and girlfriends, they microwave their relationships now. When I first started dating my wife, I sent her a letter. Five days later, she got it. <laughs> Hope I still felt that way when, I, when she got it, right? It's not like going down the road, see a bird. Oh, I'm thinking of you, babe. Five days from now, I don't even remember the bird, right? <laughs> but that's when she got the letter. Now, you five, five days, five nanoseconds, they know you're thinking about them. That's how it is with God. You can literally have instant access to the throne room of heaven. You can walk in at any point. You don't have to come to here and get on your knees. Now, when, you, when they have Saturday prayer, come. It's, it's something powerful about praying together. That's right. But that does not need to be the only time you pray. You can pray at any point. Pray without ceasing. And then he says, be thankful in all circumstances. Now, there's a big question. Can you be thankful in all circumstances? You can, because it doesn't say be thankful for every circumstance, because there's some stuff I'm not thankful for. I mean, maybe you are. Maybe you're one of those people that just, I mean, birds, bird flies over, poops on your head. You're still thankful. Maybe that's you, <laughs> but I got some stuff that have happened to me that I'm not real happy about, and I'm not thankful for, but it doesn't mean that I, in the midst of the bad, I can't find a way to be thankful to God, so be thankful in all circumstances. So if I can be always joyful, always be prayerful, always be thankful, I'm going to fulfill the will of God for my life. The thing I want you to really notice in both cases where Paul is talking about God's will, neither deal with a place, position, job, opportunity. None of it deals with any of that. What it deals with is our mindset, the way we think. It's an internal work of the heart, the spirit working within us to change us into his image, to make us more like him, which got me thinking about Paul's writing to the church at Philippi. Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, he says, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others is better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Jesus Christ had. One version says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Verse 6, though he was God, he didn't think of equality with God as something to cling to. Notice, even for Jesus, doing the will of God had nothing to do with his position. Instead, he gave up his divine privilege. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being when he appeared in human form. He humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Fulfilling the will of God for each of us is that we become more like Jesus, who was a servant to us all. Imagine that for a moment. The same God who said, let there be light, humbled himself, and served each and every one of you and me, right? I mean, how amazing is that, that he had that kind of a servant's heart? And I think sometimes that's where we miss out because we have, a, we have the will of God as an elevated position, and it's really not elevated at all. It's more about coming down and serving. He called each of us to be servants, not to be lords, not to be masters, but to be servants. That's his will for our life. It's not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think, but to consider others, to be like Jesus and to serve others. When I was 13 years old, and I didn't share this in first service, so you're glad you came today at 11. Uh, when I was 13 years old, I uh, went to a camp and went down to the front to pray at the end of a service. All the other kids were up drinking their sodas and eating candy bars at the concession stand, but I was whatever reason felt like I just needed to stick around. So the whole auditorium had emptied and I went down to the front and it was, would have been on the back side of those drums. I was kneeling down over there beside the altar area and I was praying at 13 and God gave me this picture, this vision, call it whatever you want. 
of myself standing at a pulpit, and behind me there was this globe, and it was spinning. And I felt like that was God's way of calling me to preach, though I didn't fully understand the dream at the moment. But I thought, oh, wow, I'm going to preach the gospel. The whole world is going to hear me preach. There's going to be thousands of people. It's going to be amazing. Oh, you know, 13. So <laughs> first time I spoke was when I was 15, and it was in front of six people in a Sunday school classroom. Felt a little frustrated because that's not the dream. Then I was struggling in my, early, uh, my late teens, early 20s about direction for my life and decided I wanted to pursue potential of going off to Bible college. I went and visited Kent Christian College in Dover, Delaware, and uh, <clears throat> I walked into the back door of the uh, auditorium on a Wednesday night to check out the school in the middle of the summer, and on the stage, there was like this globe, big old globe, and I thought, they were doing something to do with missions, and so, but I thought, oh, I'm preaching here. This is going to be amazing, right, because I mean, the globe. I did preach there, but never had more than like 200 people uh, on a Friday night, you know, for a college service, and so, again, I'm still waiting for this moment, right? So all my life, I've lived my life based on this one vision from God at 13 where I felt like I was going to be a preacher and I was going to preach to the globe. <laughs> I'm 51. A couple years ago, COVID hits. I'm at our church and I've been serving in ministry for a long time, always with a little bit of frustration, like when's the dream coming, God? preached a lot of messages, never really got the fulfillment of what I thought was the dream. Lived my life kind of frustrated. Anybody ever felt frustrated because it didn't work out the way you thought it would? I'm serving as executive pastor. My name's not on the front of the building. I'm not the lead guy. I'm a little frustrated there. You know, things just not working the way I thought it was going to come, the way I built it in my mind. COVID hits, and our church... We had never been online before, like with live services. Uh, I've been begging for it and just didn't have it, but suddenly we didn't have a choice. And so within one week's time, we suddenly had to put services online or we were going to miss church. And so we had to figure it out. And so we immediately, like, they closed down churches and we were online by the next Sunday. And then about four weeks after we went online, our senior pastor been preaching all those. And then I got up to preach and I preached in our online service and Pastor Tina, the next morning, I got messages from a man in India. There you go. And I got a, man, a message from a man in Scotland. And I got a message from a man in Pakistan. Places where the gospel doesn't even get to get preached. But it was there. <laughs> you reminded me of the story this morning when you said somebody in the Philippines was watching this morning. I didn't understand the script based on the way I saw it, why it wasn't coming to pass. But God was working all along the way to bring the thing to pass. So that's not the end of the story. A couple of weeks ago, I'm standing down front after our service and praying with people, and this man walks up to me, and he was from India. Never met him before. Uh, we have quite a few Indian couples in our church that are from India, but I'd never met him. And uh, come to find out, he was visiting his family. And uh, I didn't know this, but one of our Indian families in our church had been videoing me for years on his phone and sending it to his family in India. And this guy walks up to me and he says, Pastor Rodney, do you remember a message you preached and it was like from 15 years ago. So though the dream seems to tarry, though it seems like it's not coming to pass, I want to encourage you today, don't get frustrated in the moment because God is always working. And because he operates outside of time, it may not come like you think it will, but it will be perfected, matured in his time, and it will be perfect because it'll be the right dream that you were dreaming for. If you'd all stand with me, I want to finish this up today. <clears throat> so Joseph, I hadn't forgot about him. He gets out of prison finally. He ascends to second in command of all of Egypt because he managed to interpret some of Pharaoh's dreams. 
It's kind of funny. I don't think he interpreted his own dream very well, but apparently he interpreted Pharaoh's really well. <laughs> Gets promoted, saves the country, saves a bunch of other people. He laid up uh, grain so that other people would be able to eat during the time of famine. His brothers run out of food. They don't have no food in their hometown. So their dad sends them to Egypt where he heard this smart guy had figured out a way to keep food so that they would have it. Verse 40, chapter 42, verse 5, it says, So Jacob's sons arrived in Egypt along with others to buy food, for the famine was in Canaan as well. And Joseph was governor of all of Egypt and in charge of selling grain to all the people. It was to him that the brothers came. And when they arrived, they bowed before him with their faces to the ground. The dream's coming to pass. Joseph, I don't think it was how Joseph envisioned it, but it's coming to pass. And the reason why it was different, 21 years have gone by. When Joseph had the dream, he assumed they'd be bowing to him and making him elevated. But when he's 38 and they're bowing to him, he's serving them. He's providing for their needs. He's taking care of what was necessary. And so though the dream looked different than what Joseph thought, the fulfillment turns out to be what was needed in the moment. And so today, you may be going through a tough spot. You may be frustrated. Maybe even as a church. I know the church has gone through a few little bumps and bruises over the last little bit. You know what? We could get frustrated in the moment and thought, you know, we had a dream. It's not happening the way we thought. What's the deal? Though the dream doesn't come to pass like you think, just give God his time and it will work its way out the way he intended from the very beginning. When God's plan was truly revealed for Joseph's life, suddenly Joseph is serving people and he is prolonging God's plan by allowing people to live when they could have died. And what has God got planned for you? Maybe it looks different than you thought. Maybe it's in a different position than you thought. Maybe it's in a different way than you thought. But if you'll trust God with the dream, put it in his hands and recognize that my dream is for him to get glory out of my life, whatever it looks like, whatever it acts like, I just want to please him. All of a sudden, what comes to pass will bless you. It will be good. It will be pleasing, and you better believe if it's from God, it will be perfect. Amen. Say amen. Let's pray together all over this house. Father, I thank you for this moment. I thank you for the people of God who have sat with me today and, and listened to me tell this story, your goodness, your mercy, your grace in our lives. And God, today, I am so honored that you call us into a relationship with you. And I'm so thankful, God, that while others may see that calling as position or opportunity, I just want to see it today as relational. My chance to be in relationship with the God of the universe. And today, God, I submit myself to you because you were willing to die for me. The least I can do is give my life to you. And today, I'm thankful, Lord, to be in your presence where there is fullness of joy and where I can have an immediate connection of prayer to you and where I can be thankful for everything, not for it all, but in it all, God, I can be thankful because if I'll trust you in the moment, when I'm rejoicing, God, it's great, but when I'm not rejoicing, when it's tough, when I'm going through struggles, I'm learning and I'm so thankful for that today. God, let us walk in favor and faith and trust you in all things. We thank you for this moment. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, I want to encourage you to recognize the opportunity that we have right now. He calls us all into relationship with him. The Bible says many are called, but few are chosen. And I think it really is not because God doesn't choose, it's because we don't. And so today he's calling. He is putting his calling on your life, again, not to accomplish anything, other than a relationship with him. And so if you're here today and you don't know him, I just want to encourage you today. It's so simple. 
All it takes is an admission that I need him and I'm so thankful that he wants me. <laughs> a lot of people could come into relationships and it's about I need you and you need me. I need him and he wants me. And so today, God, I pray for that one person who may be here today who doesn't know you, God, that you'd come alongside of them. The Bible in John chapter 14, Lord, you said that you would be a comforter to us. The word comforter is the word parakletos, which means somebody who comes alongside. And today, I pray that you would come alongside someone who is hurting, who is lost, who is struggling, and remind them that you are for them and that you are with them and that you will never leave them, you will never forsake them, that you are their God and that you will always connect to them. We thank you today for this moment. We ask you to be in this house a special way today and touch someone's life in a way they never dreamed possible, and we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Amen. Pastor Ting. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Rodney. I'm going to ask the prayer partners to come forward for just a little bit and be available for anybody who wants to pray and needs someone to pray with them. If you made that decision this morning, we have a gift for you. If you made a decision for the first time to follow Jesus, we have a book of John that we want to help you lead along your first, your first steps with Jesus. But if your story has not matched your script and you want someone to pray with you, then these prayer partners are up here to help pray with you and for you. also want to remind you 714 on Facebook in the morning so that we can pray with you as well there. And Saturday night from 6 to 7, we're also going to be praying there. God bless you. May you go forward and show somebody who Jesus is this week. Amen? Amen. Please come forward and be prayed for.